Hi, I'm Mayor Grabunka, and I'd like to take you the opportunity to introduce you to a new program that's going to be running on Linden TV. This program is called Senior Report, and it will be hosted by George Cruz. It will be appear monthly and touch on subjects of interest to senior citizens. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Senior Report. I'm your host, George Cruz. I'd like to thank Mayor Richard Gabunka for that wonderful introduction and endorsement of our show, The Senior Report. The Senior Report is a show that will cater to seniors and their caregivers to help provide you with information on services that are out there for you, including medical health care services, products that will improve the quality of your life, and generally to inform our seniors and their caregivers on things that are going out there that may benefit you. With that said, I'd like to provide you with some information of things that are going on around town with the city of Linden. The city of Linden, New Jersey, big enough to lead, small enough to care. The Gregorio Center has lots to offer. They're located at 330 Helen Street in Linden, New Jersey. Telephone number is 908-474-8627, offering nutrition programs, health screening sponsored by the Board of Health, craft classes, workshop studios, income tax assistance, home energy assistance programs, and lots more. For more information, call 908-474-8627, the John T. Gregorio Recreation Center. Their hours are from June to September 2014. The building opens at 7 a.m. Office hours are from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. There's an exercise room open from 7 a.m. to 4.15 p.m. And remember, the building closes at 4.30 p.m. They also offer Pilates and cardio exercise classes, so keep that in mind. For adults 18 and older, it's a 10-week program, Tuesday evenings, 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. from June 17th to August 19th. The fee is only $40. For more information, contact the John T. Gregorio Center. The Linden Recreation Fall soccer registration is open to boys and girls, um, ages 4 to 14. The registration fee is only $25. For more information, call the Linden Recreation Department. They're also offering summer tennis lessons, tennis dynamics, games, contests, and prizes. Loaner rackets are provided. Uh, registration fee is only $50. For more information on Tennis Dynamics, call 973-916-1882. And the Bernice Berzot, founding chairman, invites you to join the Yellow Ribbon Campaign to support U.S. troops. They pledge to remember those who died on foreign soil, honor those who served in past wars, demand return of, foreign, of prisoners of foreign wars, seek those missing in action, and support those fighting for freedoms today. For more information on the Yellow Ribbon Campaign Committee, call 908-523-0003. Just a snippet of what's going on around town, and we'll try to provide you with that information on every show. With that said, I'd like to introduce Captain Sarnicki and Captain Hart, who's going to give us some information on the services that are provided by the City of Linden Police Department. So we had a moment to visit the Police Department, the 911 Call Center, and we briefly toured the Police Department in the City of Linden. Now let's head over to the City of Linden Police Department. We're at the Linden, New Jersey Police Department, and our guests today are Captain James Sarnicki and Captain David Hart from the Linden Police Department. I have a couple of questions and we're looking forward to a tour of the Linden Police Department. And uh, my first question is, uh, Captain, can you give us some background on the Linden Police Department? How many officers do you have and how many divisions? Uh, we have right, a complement of 135 officers. Uh, right now, uh, we're a little bit uh, undermanned. We actually have an actual complement right now of 120 officers. Um, we have a very culturally diverse police department. Uh, we have um, six females and we have uh, six African-American officers. 
In fact, we have a, a promotional ceremony coming up this week, and we expect to promote uh, one of our African-American supervisors to the rank of captain. And that'll be uh, the first in the history of the Linden Police Department. We also have a, a female officer that's going to be promoted to the rank of lieutenant. And uh, that'll be also a first in our police department. Uh, we have um, several divisions. We have an administrative division, uh, which consists of the uh, chief of police, uh, the administrative captain, which is myself, and uh, two administrative secretaries. Uh, we have an investigations division, which includes our juvenile bureau, our detective bureau, our narcotics bureau, uh, internal affairs. Uh, we also have a criminal intelligence division uh, where uh, statistics are gathered and um, uh, based on these statistics is uh, how we uh, direct our patrols. Uh, any, any specific crime trends or um, uh, any specific crimes that we're experiencing a rash of, uh, this is the way uh, we sit in the room and gather intelligence and then we plot how we're going to attack it uh, with our officers and our uh, uh, uniformed uh, uh, superiors on the street. Uh, we also have a, um, a critical infrastructure and protection unit. Uh, these are officers that uh, go out and they interact with our businesses, specifically our refinery, uh, which is a potential uh, target for a terrorist attack. And uh, we advise them on how they can better secure their facility against potential uh, terrorism and uh, how we also uh, educate them on, uh, to look for suspicious activity, uh, suspicious packages, uh, anything that's out of the ordinary, uh, we work hand in hand with the community doing that. Uh, <coughs> attached, we also have is our uh, a SWAT team or emergency uh, response team. Uh, these are highly trained officers uh, that uh, uh, we call out in, in cases of emergency if we have barricaded suspects. And uh, also they serve as an entry team for our narcotics unit uh, because uh, uh, when we uh, effect a search warrant. Uh, we, we know now that a lot of uh, narcotics dealers uh, do carry weapons, so as a precaution we use our SWAT team uh, as an entry team to uh, go inside the house or the structure where they're going into uh, for officer safety. <coughs> we also have uh, an officer assigned to Homeland Security and counterterrorism. Uh, he's a, uh, a veteran officer who's presently working uh, with the FBI at the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, in Newark, and uh, it's an asset to our police department to have an officer assigned there uh, because we liaison with him and there's an exchange of intelligence information going back and forth uh, between uh, us and him on any uh, leads. Uh, we also have a uniform services division, uh, which is headed by my colleague here, Captain uh, David Hart. Uh, uniform services division includes uh, the uniform patrol division and it includes our traffic bureau, uh, which includes investigators, uh, which uh, monitor our red light cameras, and also um, investigate accidents, hit and runs, and uh, so forth. Uh, what responsibilities does your Office of Emergency Management have? Oh, it's a broad-based, the OEM uh, years, was incorporated many years ago. Over the last three to five, ten years, and really probably since 9-11, most OEMs, and certainly in the bigger communities, New York City, a town the size of Linden, and even the smaller towns in Union County have really ramped up. Uh, it's, what it encompasses is multiple disciplines coming together and working together. Uh, the city of Linden actually has one OEM coordinator, which is Chief Schulhafer of the Linden Police Department, and then five deputy coordinators. That encompasses the fire department, uh, the police, public works, and the private industry. Uh, we work together. Uh, their main function is to coordinate during any major emergency or disaster or even a pre-planned event, a major event coming to the town, coordinate with all the disciplines within the town, <coughs> Uh, to pre-plan for any emergency or any unforeseen instance. Uh, during the storm and before the storm, we met regularly with the mayor's office, uh, Board of Health, Public Works, Fire, Police, and any uh, other agencies that might be needed during the storm to plan what we would do in certain, uh, certain, if certain issues arose. And then, uh, again, in a pre-planned situation, such as even a, uh, a graduation or a parade, we would meet again with discipline to uh, make sure we have everything in order and our plans are up to date and uh, everything is ready to go for any emergency that may arise. Uh, in addition to that, we also have physical resources. We have a few trucks. We've also put out cones, barricades in the med of emergency or road closure. We have many volunteers too, which are unsung heroes of our OEM that come out, don't get paid, 
I call them at 10 o'clock at night. I need 25 cones put out at an accident scene. They come out and they assist us with barricades, cones, and also even pre-planned events, parades and things. These volunteers come out and assist us with road closures and with light towers and, uh, and equipment such as that. Greatly. Um, can you explain what the crisis intervention team is all about? The crisis intervention team is, is, is a, a relatively new phenomenon that uh, the Linda Police Department has, has gone to. Uh, it is uh, run by uh, one of our sergeants, uh, Abdul Williams, and uh, he is also a uh, uh, instructor in that field. Uh, presently, we have 31 officers that are trained in CIT, and basically what the crisis intervention team does is they respond to calls where we are dealing with uh, individuals who are uh, emotionally disturbed, or may have some type of uh, physical uh, ailment or handicap. And the whole purpose is to present a positive interaction with law enforcement. Uh, as you probably remember or, or watched on the news in the past, uh, we've had some incidences on TV that you see with the police interacting with mentally ill people which have had a disastrous consequences. And uh, the whole purpose of crisis intervention is we have the officers, uh, uh, e even though they are trained, to, to have a positive influence on their interaction uh, w with somebody who, who maybe uh, have emotional issues, like I said, get them to a hospital, get them the help that they need. And, and the whole purpose is to try to have them avoid the criminal justice system. Uh, it does nobody good for us to be arresting uh, people that have problems, emotional problems, uh, so we, our purpose is to get them the help they need. And, and we're very proud of our program. We, uh, our, our instructors train uh, officers from all over New Jersey on, on this program. And um, it, it's an excellent program. It's uh, relatively new. Uh, every year they also have an Easter egg hunt uh, at, the, at the Tiger Stadium here where the officers invite uh, all kids to come out from the city that may have uh, handicaps or uh, issues and they have an Easter egg hunt, and our officers will volunteer to go out there. Uh, we have a lot of sponsors for this event, and, uh, and it's, it just shows you one of the good things that the police department does in, in dealing with the community and, and um, you know, assisting people that uh, uh, you know, may present potential problems. So much can be averted. I mean, there's so many things that we hear now uh, that's going on, um, and we kind of missed that there's uh, psychological problems going on with these people. They fall through the cracks and then a crisis happens in the community. Someone gets hurt. They hurt someone <clears throat> or they hurt themselves. Right. Um, I, I'm sure you don't know, I, I was a crisis worker for about 25 years with three different hospitals including Princeton Medical Center, Palisade General Hospital and St. Mary's in Hoboken. Mm -hmm. And we worked very closely with the police and fire departments and um, we saw people who were at their worst, suicidal, homicidal, or psychotic. Um, and the police, like your uh, crisis intervention team, uh, would come in, we'd do the evaluations in the emergency room and determine whether or not these people needed to be admitted to a psychiatric unit or if they can be referred out. You'll be surprised how many needed to be admitted or committed uh, to a unit uh, against their wills. Uh, sometimes we can talk them into signing in and sometimes they couldn't and they were too um, at, at a point where uh, they needed to be committed and we have two physicians sign off on them and um, court ordered uh, yeah. commitment. Um, so, so having a team like this is so valuable and can help out, I mean pointing out who in the community needs the help, getting them to an emergency room that has psychiatric emergency services mm -hmm. so that they can be channeled into the right area and um, monitored by them on a regular basis so that they can get better and you avoid a crisis in the community. So I'm, I'm really interested in that um, uh, crisis intervention team and I, I'd like to meet some of the people from that team uh, at a, another time. Uh, but uh, it's, it's great that you have that and I think every township should have that. <clears throat> what, are the, what are some of the major challenges that your department faces in the future? Uh, uh, it's actually quite, times are challenging for most police departments, I think, in this country, definitely Union County. 
Uh, there's some main, ch the main challenges facing most departments today are, are, are financial, fiscal challenges, uh, manpower, getting more done with less resources. I think that's across the board probably. Most city agencies would tell you that, most police departments would tell you that. I said we're down of almost 15 officers at this point. Uh, of course, financially, uh, well, most, uh, most towns are hard up for money or, or, or struggling to get by with what they have. Uh, there's so many, also in the, in the police field, there's so many legal mandates today that uh, we have to uh, adhere to. Uh, when we, Captain Sonic and myself came on, uh, you know, 25, 30, 35 years ago, uh, times have changed drastically with legal mandates from the state attorney general's office, with the county prosecutor's office, mandates the things that way things have to be handled or must be done. Uh, things were simpler, as they say, 20, 30 years ago uh, than they are today. Uh, there's much more technology today, as we are aware of. Uh, we're going away from a paper reporting system to everything is computerized now, from lookups to uh, motor vehicle lookups to doing an accident report, to running someone for a warrant check, to having uh, license plate scanners in the cars, to radar units, to texting, to social media within the police department. It's quite complex, uh, the technology, even in the last three to five years is quite amazing. Uh, training mandates also, uh, we want a professional police department. Uh, we have to have uh, upgrade our training. Some is mandated and some is in enhanced above and beyond what uh, is mandated. But uh, we want a well-trained police department and with training mandates, that certainly puts challenges with the manpower and staffing and uh, things of that nature. And also our overall call volume has uh, increased drastically. Uh, I don't know if the Captain Sonicki has the exact statistics. I would say over 65,000 calls last year for service. You know, ranging from uh, alarms to accidents to uh, you know, warrants to a, a, sick do a sick person to an injured dog. Wide a wide variety of uh, calls, but calls for service have increased steadily over the last three to five years. So with increased call volume, less money, less finances, less manpower, more mandates, more training, uh, any administrator will tell you it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, we have a uh, very uh, robust police department from our administration right down to the street officers, to our detectives, and throughout the whole police department, we're working together to get the job done the best we can. And uh, the challenges are there, but we are me meeting the challenges. Um, I have a couple of questions from the community. Um, one was on community p policing. Is the typical pr uh, patrolman in contact with the community on a regular basis? Do they drop in businesses uh, to check on things and speak to residents in the community? Now, I know we, you don't have a community policing program per se, but you do have police that patrol. I, we, we did have a, a community <coughs> policing unit a couple of years ago, uh, but due to staffing issues, uh, we, we had to have a curtail it. And uh, we just remind all our officers that community policing is the job of every police officer on the street. And um, uh, we do encourage our officers to uh, engage in park and walks where they could park their patrol car in the business community, get out, talk to some of the people on the street, talk to some of the business owners. And uh, you can't underestimate the value of face-to-face -face <laughs> interaction between the police and the community. And, uh, and, and that's what, if I get one complaint from a lot of businesses or people, that's that they don't see a police car in their neighborhood or the police don't wave at them or some S Simple things like that. W riding down a neighborhood and waving at the residents. Uh, it, it means a lot. I mean, it, it, stop if, guy, if a guy's mowing his grass, pull over and talk to him for a few minutes. Uh, one of our lieutenants who's uh, uh, actually uh, had all of his officers go out uh, to their districts and actually uh, meet their mailman. And actually the lieutenant told his officers, I want you to go out and meet the mailman, put your arm around him and take a picture and bring it back to me. Because the mailman is a good source of information in the neighborhood. And if anything's mm -hmm. going on in a certain in, in the neighborhood, the mailman knows about it. And this is a way for the police to get out there and uh, engage the community. So. Um, uh, even though we, we don't really have a community policing unit, uh, we try to impress on our officers that community policing is everybody's job. And any opportunity you get to interact with the community, uh, whether it's uh, giving talks or going out in, in the public and um, going to schools, we have a school resource officer, uh, which we just, we had one and then we were forced to give it up because of manpower, but we have them back in the schools, in the high school and the middle schools this year. You can't underestimate the value of that where now the students have a police officer in the school that they can go to and interact with 
and uh, on a regular basis, and it's not an emergency. And once they get to meet him, uh, you'd be surprised uh, at the amount of information an officer gets about problems or potential criminal activity or narcotics activity. And uh, this, it's a good source of information for us to get. And, and we've underestimated that, and, and thank goodness we're back utilizing that. So what are the typical scams that um, seniors have to look out for in Linden? Uh, uh, I used to work in the detective bureau for five years uh, as, a, as the commander of the detective bureau, and I have a lot of experience working with seniors being victims uh, of crime. Uh, Linden has a large senior population, and uh, especially during this time of year, we see the police reports every day where uh, there's attempts by seniors to be uh, scammed. Uh, it could either be in person by people coming to their doors dressed up as utility workers. Uh, it could be over the phone where people are calling up and, and, and demanding money payment over the phone or go down to your local CVS and get a money dot car, card uh, and if you don't we're going to cut off your electricity so they impersonate like PSE and G workers and, and even in the mail. They get, they, there's mail scams <clears throat> where uh, these senior citizens are getting uh, these bogus checks and they'll say, you know, uh, pay to the order and have your name on it. It'll say $5,000. And people will think these are legitimate checks, that they're getting something for nothing. And, uh, and every week we also get the reports where people are being called up or they receive a letter saying that they won a lottery and they won a million dollars. But in order to get that million dollars, they got to pay a fee of $1,000 to get that million. And my suggestion is, I tell people all the time, if you did not enter a lottery, you can't win the lottery, all right? Something for nothing, you're not going to get something for nothing. So uh, as far as uh, uh, the, the burglaries or distraction burglaries, uh, beware of suspicious people in cars. We, we, every time we put this out, we always get calls because people seem to be listening to us. We get calls all the time that strangers are knocking on people's doors and they're calling the police. That's what we want. If you're not expecting a visitor to your home, don't let that person in your home. And uh, there, there's a lot of scams. I sometimes give talks to senior citizens and uh, I will continue to do so because I'm, I'm passionate about uh, people that prey on our seniors uh, because they are the most vulnerable members of our society. And a lot of times they just, um, uh, they're victimized simply because they're elderly and, and the criminal element knows that uh, they may not have the perfect vision to identify them in court again and, and they take advantage of that. And uh, I, we have a lot of experience, uh, I have a lot of experience dealing with uh, elderly crime and uh, uh, you know, hopefully I want to continue to get the message out that uh, you know, if you come to Linden to uh, inflict crime against the elderly, you know, we're going we're gonna to catch you. Well, you hear it here. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, and keep watching our show. You'll have more informative information from our two captains here today. Uh, Captain, I'm wondering if you can give us a tour of the police department where the calls come into and maybe even the holding cells for these scammers uh, to when they sit in. <laughs> okay. As you can see, one here comes here, one size fits all. You have multiple prisoners, we just line them up here. And this is where they stay and this is where they're booked. What do you call this area? Uh, booking area. It's a booking area with a temporary detention. Okay. And then when, from here they're taken into this room where they're fingerprinted, photographed. All digital now. Huh? All digital, no more yep, yep. ink. This is Sega Morpho, this goes, uh, it's all digital fingerprints, no more ink. We do ink as a backup. Okay, I mean, if the, if, if the computers go down like technology right. breaks or goes down, then we do use uh, ink as a backup. But this is our uh, area, and this is, this is where they're over here. Okay. Uh, here's your booking photo, booking camera right here. Uh, and everything's computerized. Uh, as soon as they're booked up here, everything goes right upstairs. Yeah, so we do have the old ink pads here. So, all right, thank you, too. Sure Needless to say, this is one area that you don't want to visit. If you're scamming seniors or you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing, you're going to be behind these. This is our, this is our dispatch center. Hello, how are you? Hi, how are you? These gentlemen are just doing some filming. 
to make it a TB36 shell. This is our dispatch center. As you can see right now, we only have we still we have one dispatcher working right here, and these are dispatching stations. Four dispatching stations. And this is where all the calls come in. On a typical Friday night, would you have two or three yeah. dispatchers? Yeah, but what is it? What do you have, two minimum? Two minimum, hopefully four. Four, four, four ideal situation? Ideal, yeah. Okay. During the hurricane. During the hurricane. Oh, we were fully staffed for had to. Yeah. And, and the calls were not stopped, over, yeah. overloading. People were calling for every, you know. I mean, you get if you get one tree down and one wire down, yeah. to you it's one incident, but to the public, you're getting a hundred calls on one tree right. down. So, and you got to answer every call, and you know you have to do an, uh, uh, the our desk takes the overload. All right, Dave. George is asking about Hurricane Sandy. How was this place during Hurricane Sandy? It was you extremely busy. Yeah, extremely busy. Yeah. I told you how many calls were you getting? Like, I guess the first two days, let's say. Well, there were hundreds of calls coming and somebody couldn't answer and they overflowed other towns. Towns overflowing to our uh, dispatch center. Uh, With the hurricane, our priorities evolved. They changed every day. Yes. Initially, it was when the rain came, I guess, it was, it was some flooding. But it, because of the wind, it was mostly wires and trees down. And then uh, it was. Then we had, uh, what was the after that? Then we had, some people trapped in their homes and people calling about you know, electricity and then medical. I got our medical calls weren't as heavy in the first day or two as we could have been, right. but a uh, multitude of problems and we just prioritized and, uh, and then work, after, we work it from there. And then after four or five days it became a, a availability of uh, fuel. So now we had to, we had to reestablish our priorities and we actually had to go out and maintain order at the service stations because you, you can imagine the few stations that were open, you know, we had people you know, fighting with each other, to get, you know, the heat cut in line, and it's just, you, you see uh, humanity uh, at its best and at its worst. You see people well behaved and you see people that, you know, just can't handle the pressure. Well, it, from the sounds of it, it sounds like the city of Linden really is prepared for uh, most disasters, even things that you wouldn't expect, whether it's a terrorist attack or uh, a natural disaster. Yeah, it's probably because of our location. We have major highways running through the city. Uh, we have a waterfront. Uh, you know, you're, you're bordering areas that uh, anything to me, anything can happen. So, uh, you know, we, we try to be prepared the best we can, and, and we, we did learn a lot from uh, Superstorm Sandy. So, hopefully, we are prepared in the unlikely event that uh, you know we're faced with that again. Well, I'd like to thank Captain Sarnicki and Captain Hart for the tour and for the information sharing with our seniors and residents of the city of Linden. There's so much that goes on be behind the scenes that we don't know. We really should appreciate what the city of Linden Police Department does to protect us, our seniors, their caregivers, and the residents of the city of Linden. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Beyond Caring. Beyond Caring Home Care specializes in offering the following home health care services, private duty, intermittent care, respite care, care for people with disabilities, companion care, personal care, daily living activities, sitter service, and household services. You can contact them at 1-877-717-0085 or Google and contact them by calling beyondcaringhc.com. That's www.beyondcaringhc.com. And thanks again for joining us on the Senior Report.